Hello and welcome to SLP Full Disclosure. I am your host, Jennifer Martin, and joining me is my amazing sidekick producer, Jonathan Carey. I like that intro a lot better. <laughs> so let's, it, let's stick to that. <laughs> it, it's evolving. Um, and you just like that amazing is said before yes. anything else. Yeah. So I yeah. get it. I mean, who no doesn't want ever, to be amazing though? I was going to say, nobody ever, my whole life has introduced me that way. So maybe <laughs> next time you introduce me that way. Well, you should definitely introduce the guests as amazing today because they definitely are. Oh my gosh. Yes. She is one that Jonathan always gets nervous when I'm like, I have a crush. I want to talk to you. He's like, oh no. Oh no. But this one was, it's like, most of the time it's good. Yeah. It works out. But I'm just curious before I introduce her, what is your creativity level? Like if you had to say like zero <laughs> to 10, like if you, 10 being the most creative you could mm -hmm. ever imagine, where are you at normally? Um, well, I think whatever I say, it's also going to be correlated with my arrogance level, you know, because if okay. I say I'm like a 10 out of 10 creative and people are like, yeah, sure. He's 10 out of 10, you know? So, um, it's subjective. I'll, I'll go can... with a safe, uh, eight. You oh, know? that's pretty high. Well, I'm a creative person, but yeah. I just don't want to be too creative, you know? Yeah, you got to keep that, that that two two from the top so that you can still have room to grow. Yeah, and you know, you got to keep your feet on the ground a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't <laughs> float away like a helium balloon with that head get so big. <laughs> so I asked because our guest today is very creative and I, I became aware of her because her work is really stands out and I encourage all of you to go and check it out after we talk because she's but before you enter her though I think everyone is curious to know what is your creativity it, it, level it, it's not eight um <laughs> it's funny because I was thinking 8. about 1. this <laughs> <laughs> let's say maybe I, I have a lot of creative thoughts, mm -hmm. but it's getting them into action is the breakdown. Yes. So I don't know. I feel like that lowers my score because you have creative thoughts, mm -hmm. but then you can put them into action. Yeah. So if you're an eight, I would say I'm a nine. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say I'm a five. I, I think you're more of a six. I'll you give think you a that. six? Okay. You know. All right. If I would have said it. seven, your head would have gotten too big. So. It, it, it was already getting there. So I was I was feeling that way with a five. So, yeah. But our guest today, let me tell you a little bit about her because she is very, I would give her a 10. I'm, I'm going to give her a 10. Even if she didn't give herself a 10, I'm giving her a 10. <laughs> um, our guest today is Belinda Givens. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She is the owner and founder of BVG Spirit. SLP. She is a children's book author and has been an ASHA certified speech language pathologist for 14 years. Belinda started her SLP career with adults and she worked in a variety of settings and really loved that population, but then ventured into the school setting um, to be on the same schedule as her kids. She served on ASHA's telepractice convention committee for two years and presented at the ASHA convention in 2019 as part of the Innovation Station for Telepractice. She currently works as a teletherapist serving school-age students and loves it. And Belinda has a company called BVG SLP and specializes in creating no prep, no print digital therapy materials that are great for use within teletherapy platforms or a face-to-face -face therapy. She is passionate about literacy and tries to incorporate it into most of her therapy sessions. And on a personal note, Belinda is the mother of three amazing young boys, has been married for 19 years, and resides in Central Florida with her family. So we are so happy to have Belinda on the podcast today. So Belinda Givens, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh my goodness. You have no idea. I have wanted to have you on for so long. And 
I know you're very busy and <laughs> we're in the middle of a pandemic and remote learning and all the fun stuff that comes with it. So I am so glad the stars aligned and that we get to finally catch up and have a conversation. Absolutely. And like I tell you all the time, you and I could talk for hours. I th think it's the SLPs in us, but I enjoy having conversations with you and I am excited to be here. Yeah, awesome. Well, I always like to just hear from the beginning and I don't know this information beforehand because I always like to be surprised and, and learn what everybody else does. But what brought you into this field? Kind of walk us through what started the process, the thought process. How did you hear about this? What made you want to be an SLP? I'm just, I'm curious. Yes, the road for me to becoming an SLP was actually a career change. My undergrad is in psychology from Florida State, and immediately after graduating with my bachelor's degree, I started working in the corporate world, and I worked in corporate America for about five years in the insurance consulting arena and knew very early on that corporate America was not for me, and I started researching communication sciences and disorders and got in touch with the UCF um, graduate program and the counselors there and talked to um, one in particular who told me her complete story. And she really painted a, an excellent picture of how the field of speech and language pathology is such a great field for, for mothers, for working moms. And I was at that point in my life where I knew I wanted a, a career that was gonna allow me to be a mom first and kind of also have a professional career. And so I got into the graduate program and I absolutely love the fact that what we do allows us to empower people. And that brings me so much joy. I love the fact that I get to connect with my students. I get to connect with their families and it's just such a rewarding profession to be in. So I'm so glad I stumbled upon the speech and language pathology field. And I'm so happy that it is something that has truly kind of awakened a passion in me. Um, while I was in grad school, I did pursue my um, reading endorsement, and that really has helped to shape the direction of where I go with resources and the things that I create, because I truly have a passion for language and literacy. So I think I found my niche, and I'm glad that I have, because it's been a, an awesome journey so far. That is so, I love those this is why I love asking people that question because it's like no, no two people kind of kind of came into this um, the same way. And so I love that um, you, you kind of stumbled upon this, like you say. Um, and I also think, too, that it's interesting, the psychology piece, you probably use that more than you realize in this field. Oh, absolutely. I think it definitely helps me with that connection component. And mm -hmm. I say all the time that more important than anything that you're doing with your clients, be they pediatric up to geriatric, it's so important that you form a true rapport. If you can get that rapport going first, you can go into a session with just conversation and you can really excite a child if you're talking about things that they're interested in. So it's so important to build that rapport and be able to connect with your clients first and foremost, I think. Um, and I do think that the psychology component definitely helps with that. Yeah, you're exactly right. If you don't, because if we don't have that relationship as the foundation, it's really hard to continue to have an ongoing relationship and to open up and feel like you can trust somebody and um, all those good things. And I'm curious too, just because I was I was thinking about this myself the other day, and I kind of stumbled into this because I had a brother that was receiving services. And so, and my mom was a special education director. And so I knew of the speech therapist or speech teacher as we called them. And I just remember feeling like so envious when she would come and get other kids. And I think like, I want to go. They say have so much fun. <laughs> Do you remember that person being in your building growing up? Or did you even know, like when you heard about the field, when you were thinking about going into it, did you think, oh, I remember that person at my school? Or were you just like, no memory? I do remember that. I definitely think every SLP can relate to that in some instance, because, of course, the SLP was always the one that came to get the kids and came, <laughs> and the students would come back with some type of trinket or toy yes. or something from the prize box. So, of course, it was like, OK, what are they doing in there that I can't go? I want to go to speech. So, yeah, absolutely. I think we all can relate to that. I was like, well, I want to go to the party. What the heck? 
what am I missing? Remember, yeah, exactly. And I remember too when I was at the public schools, the kids were please take me, take me. Right. So I was like, yeah, I, I get it. So definitely. And then the kids who never want to graduate. I can remember kids that you would have even like the fifth graders. It was always something that yeah. you would say was a treat when you would have a fifth grader yeah. who didn't want to graduate from speech, and they would tell you, oh, I don't want to graduate, and it was because they enjoyed coming to speech mm-hmm. so much. So that was always a, a major compliment. Yeah, and those ones, so if something happened and you didn't get them, where were you? Exactly. <laughs> Why didn't you come get me? <laughs> exactly. I've been looking forward to this all day. Exactly. Well, and so through this, once you started down this SLP road, what are some of the populations and settings that you've worked in? Um, So far, and I love the fact that we can say so far about our profession mm-hmm. because there's so many opportunities for us. Um, I think it's such a fortunate thing that we have the ability to work with pediatric to geriatric. So for me, my so far is that I've worked on the medical side of the field. I've worked with adult clients in skilled nursing facilities. I've worked um, in ALFs, assisted living facilities. I worked for a short time in a TBI clinic. Um, And then as much as I enjoyed working with adults, and I do miss it at times, I love the interaction that I had with my adult clients. But once I had my third son, I quickly realized that it was important for me to be on their schedule. So like most working moms, especially SLPs, we tend to venture to the school system when we get to that point where it's like, okay, I want my summers off with my kids. I want to have spring breaks and the holidays. So I ventured into the public school system. And I did that for a short time. And most recently, I discovered teletherapy. And I absolutely love it. And for the past five years, I've been working as a teletherapist with school school age students. Yeah, and I was going to say, I wouldn't even say recently, you were one of the OGs, I feel like with the <laughs> oh, teletherapy, you know, before it was everybody was a teletherapist, you were in the beginning when I feel like that's when I was starting to hear more about what do you mean we can work remote? I mean, yeah, nobody exactly. would have ever thought we could have worked remotely when we were in school. So, uh, and I'd love to know because again, I know five years doesn't seem like that long, but again, in this span of time, it really was when a lot of people were just starting to do it. How did you even hear about it or even think, hmm, I- I'm going to give that a try? You know, it probably was about six years ago, and I was one of those SLPs like many who was reluctant at first, so I didn't dive right in. I started researching it. I joined the SIG-18 for telepractice and did my research first. Um, I remember getting emails about teletherapy and telepractice and was a little reluctant to give it a try, the idea of working from home and still being able to connect with my students via a computer. Um, at that time seemed a little foreign, but at the same time in the school system, having the caseload that I had at that time, I was working with, I think, about 85 students. I was split Mm -hmm. between two schools, a middle school and an elementary school. And it just wasn't something that I felt like I could be effective, let alone highly effective for my students. So I think that's kind of what motivated me to say, okay, I would like to at least try it. And so when I tried teletherapy, it really was a refreshing change. (laughs) I say all the time, and I still say it today, five years later, that I absolutely love teletherapy. And it's not just the idea that, oh, I get to work remotely from home. That's one benefit of it. But I do truly love the fact that you see the gains in your students, for me personally, so much faster because you're able to work in smaller groups. So I'm working one-to-one or two-to-one with my students. I'm building that rapport that we talked about. And in addition to that, when the families are involved, they're right there. They're usually within an earshot of our therapy session. So they're hearing what we're doing and they're able to then repeat that. And so the carryover is better um, and faster. So outcomes tend to be better in my experience. All of that has just made me love teletherapy, and I think I'm here to stay. You said I was (laughs) one of the original OGs, and that definitely is something that you look at it now and how many people didn't necessarily choose teletherapy, but they were kind of forced into it because of the pandemic, unfortunately. But I can tell you it brings me joy when I get emails from SLPs who were reluctant at first, but now that they've tried it, 
they also love it. So they're asking me, okay, how do I make this my permanent position? So that has been, that's been, I guess, a, a positive side of all the negative things that we're going through right now with the pandemic is a lot of people have been exposed to teletherapy that may have not otherwise tried it. And they're realizing how much they like it. And not only that, the fact that it is a very effective service delivery model. So I'm here to stay. I think I'm here to stay (laughs) for teletherapy for sure. Well, and I remember the first time I spoke with you um, that your passion for this is I could feel it even from the initial conversation. (laughs) So it's obvious that this is your space where you, all the stars aligned for you to be here. And I agree with you so much about what you said, because I also thought initially before doing some teletherapy, how can I feel like I'm connecting to them? Um, And I also at one point had 90 kids on my caseload Mm -hmm. at school And I was just telling somebody this story the other day that I was in a very high need school where I said to the principal on more than one occasion, can I please start doing therapy over the intercom? (laughs) Because Mm. I was like, that would be, I could actually, (laughs) because they just kept coming. And I would have groups of seven kids. And I remember feeling like, gosh, you know, I've got seven kids, 30 minutes. What am I accomplishing? And the only thing I could come back to was some of these kids that, had pretty challenging home lives. And I kept thinking, well, at the very least, I was a positive interaction with an adult that day, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't an effective speech therapist. That's for sure. So I think you're exactly right. It allows you, people think like, oh, well, you can't connect over the computer, but actually being able to be focused on that student or those, let's say two students, you really are able to be much more effective and really customized to what they need instead of trying to work with seven kids with different needs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And the fact that you're able to connect one-on-one or two-to-one, you get to know your students better. Mm -hmm. You really get to know what they like and what excites them. And then when you're able to incorporate that into the teletherapy session, I mean, it's a win-win. It's golden because they're more motivated to work for you. They're excited to see you every day and they want to be there and want to work hard for you because you've taken that taken that vested interest in wanting to get to know them better. So I agree that the teletherapy, although it is remote via computer, mm-hmm. the connections are just as, or in many cases, more um, or stronger with your teletherapy clients. We'll be right back to our interview. We just want to take a brief moment to shout out the company that makes this show possible, Med Travelers. If you are a therapist interested in traveling, visit medtravelers.com to explore the amazing benefits that Med Travelers has to offer. Featuring short and long-term contract opportunities at leading facilities across the country with higher earning potential, W-2 employee status, and a flexible schedule, Med Travelers is your advocate for career success. Visit medtravelers.com to begin your travel adventure today. And now back to the show. One of the things that I think really set you apart, and I know some people may not recognize the name Belinda Givens, but I think a lot of people recognize BVG SLP. <laughs> and that's actually how I became familiar with you is through Teachers Pay Teachers. And I've got to tell you too, that I'm one of those people that I will be drawn to products based on the label and your label (laughs) is actually, I thought, oh, that's interesting. And that's actually what made me even go to your, your page with all the information. So, uh, was just really drawn to it, but you have a really interesting story. You started again in doing teletherapy years ago, and I'd love for you to tell me and our listeners about what you did to start creating your own materials, what brought you to that? And uh, because that's something I think it's a lot of people wouldn't even begin to understand the first step to that. So what what made you want to do that in the first place? You know, when I started creating materials, it was because five years ago, and I'm sure you can relate to this, but many years back and five years doesn't seem that long ago, but for the teletherapy world, 
five years ago, there's been so much that has happened and so much that has changed in five years. But back then, when I went out looking for the materials that I wanted to use with my students, particularly, I could not find um, teletherapy platform friendly resources. I couldn't find things that were specifically made for speech and language that were digital. Um, I couldn't find the really um, colorful, vibrant things that I knew that I wanted to use. So I just started creating what I needed for my students. Never did I intend on creating a store or selling my products. It wasn't until my sister, who's been a teacher for almost 30 years, she saw what I was creating and she was the one that encouraged me to start a TPT store. Um, so I started down that road of looking into and researching and just trying to figure it out because I was already creating the products. Now it became, how do I get them out into the world for other people to see? Um, and just doing the research on TPT has a university, spending lots of long nights researching and um, becoming very well versed on copyright laws and finding the clip art that I wanted. I had a certain look and feel that I had in mind that I wanted for my students. And I just researched until I could find it. I really felt like representation was extremely important and I still do. And I wanted resources that would speak to my students and be diverse. And so I started creating them, started on TPT. A year after that, I discovered Boom Cards and I started a Boom Learning Store. And then probably about a year and a half ago, I started selling direct on my website. So now I have three <laughs> online e-commerce stores selling my resources. And it's just such an amazing feeling to know that people discover my products through, like you said, the logo. And I have to give credit to my other sister. I have two sisters. My other sister, who's a graphic designer, she created that logo for me initially. And I've never changed it because I also think that I, I do really <laughs> love that logo. Purple is my favorite color. And so that logo has been with me since I started on TPT and um it's been a journey, but one that has been so, it's been exciting and rewarding. And it's just hard to put into words how, I guess, mind-blowing it is sometimes when I look and see that my resources are being purchased from all over the world. That blows my mind even to say it out loud. Um, but it's it's been an awesome journey and one that wasn't necessarily planned. It happened. And I say it wasn't necessarily planned. I do think it, everything's in the master's plan. So it was in his plan. And it just all kind of like you said, the stars aligned and everything worked out the way it was intended to. So it's, it's been awesome, an awesome journey. Yeah. And, but you didn't take the easy way. It was definitely where you saw a need for something and took initiative and, and found a solution. And now, now what I love about that story is your solution didn't only help you, but so many other people. And I encourage anybody to go, uh, like you said, to your TPT store or Boom Cards. Your look is so great. I, I love the graphics. I love the different variety of things you have. And I do agree with you that that is something that is so lacking in the materials in this field is representation. And it's really, it, it's, it's so refreshing that there is some place that people can go and find something because we can't, we're working with people that look different. And oftentimes there's nothing that they can relate to um, those students. And so I love that you're incorporating that and making that a really big part of your mission. I think that's, it's uh, long overdue in our oh, field. Thank you. And it's a passion. It's a passion of mine. And it definitely brings me joy when I mm -hmm. receive emails from SLPs or even a friend of mine recently told me she was working with a student and using one of my resources and the student um, pointed out that the little kid looked like him. And so oh. to know that the, the clip art does translate, students notice that. I mean, it's so important that they can see them portrayed through mm -hmm. what it is that we're doing for them. So it's something that I will continue to do because it, it brings me joy and I'm very passionate about it. Yes, I'm so glad that you do that. And I'm wondering also, uh, how would you even, and I d definitely don't, I mean, you've, you've created, uh, you probably have some, some, uh, a lot of proprietary things and trade secrets that, because you've worked hard to get to where you are, but how does one even, how did you even learned. I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Like I would Google. <laughs> That's what 
I go to for everything. My medical diagnosis, my, <laughs> and it's like, uh, Dr. Google, I, where, how do you even begin? And you know, for me, I think it was my background in corporate America. When I was in corporate mm-hmm. America, I did lots of PowerPoints. As a, I worked as an account manager for an insurance consulting firm. And even though I wasn't doing things that were similar to the resources that I create, I did learn a lot about PowerPoint. And mm-hmm. so I start with PowerPoint. That's kind of the foundation. I always say all roads lead back to PowerPoint. That's for <laughs> me personally, only because I'm familiar with it and it works for me. I know other creators and designers create in different on different platforms, but mm-hmm. because I'm familiar with PowerPoint and it works for me and it's easy for me personally to use, I start there. And I mean, the ideas just kind of flow from inspiration from my students, inspiration from my own three boys. Um, I have so, I can't even tell you, I have so many ideas, <laughs> so many things that are just kind of jotted down on paper that I haven't had time this past year to even think about creating the way I used to. So um, I do plan to continue to create, but it's it's a passion. And I think it's just that creative side of me. I, I It's within me, I guess. It must be <laughs> because I know it's like I'm thinking. I again, if Google can't tell me how to do it, it's like I don't, I'm, I'm lost. And do you get some of your ideas? Do you do you think about your own caseload and think, oh, I don't have anything for that, so I'm going to make it? Or do you try to see what's really lacking in in the industry? How do you come up with with most of your ideas? Honestly, in the very beginning, my ideas came from the need that I had specifically with my students. So I might be working with a particular student and I needed a resource for that student. I would incorporate their likes into the resource, that rapport that we talked about. I always take an inventory with my students at the very beginning to kind of get a feel for what their interests are, what they like. And so a lot of the inspiration in the very beginning was from my students. Um, Now that I've been doing it for a while, a a lot of it now is coming more so from request. I get tons of requests via email now from SLPs that might tell me that, oh, I think this would be a great resource. I would love for you to create this for me. And I do want to say this past year has been extremely busy. So if you've reached out to me, I respond to everyone. But if I haven't created the resource yet, the keyword is yet, please, I thank you for your patience. I will definitely plan to start back creating once things get a little bit, a little bit slower because things have been crazy busy. But um, I get a lot of requests now from fellow SLPs. And as a mom wearing the mom hat, my boys give me inspiration every day. (laughs) We can be riding bikes, playing a game, reading a book, you name it. I mean, they might say something or do something or Um, they even tell me, mom, I think this would be a good lesson. It's turned into like a little family affair (laughs) because they inspire me too with things that they think I should create. And they're my, they're my best critics too. They'll tell me, oh, I don't think this one's going to be that fun. (laughs) Or they'll say, oh, you should add this or you should do that. But they're my biggest cheerleaders too. So I love the fact that I have them to kind of, to cheer me on, but also tell me things that they think will work and things that might not work. That is awesome. You almost have your built-in quality control (laughs) in your house. Uh, And and they will. They're honest. I remember my daughter one time saying, because I worked with babies coming out of the NICU for years and did feeding and swallowing. And I remember her one day saying, well, when I um, grow up, basically, I'm going to get a a real job and not just feed babies. Oh, wow. (laughs) She said, didn't say it like, the, but it was, right. that, that was, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like it or not, they, uh, they, they speak the truth. So oh, at least absolutely. you know, you're getting the real truth from your kids. And I think that's a great, because sometimes I know I've thought, oh, this is going to be uh, some of my lessons. I think this is going to be a big hit. They're going to love this. And it bombs. Mm-hmm. And then other times those things where I'm like, uh, oh, sorry, this isn't going to be very good. And they were like, this is so great. So you have that built in right there in your own home. Oh yeah. And if they approve, then I know it's a winner. And when they tell me that they don't think it's going to be the best, then I go back to the drawing board. So they definitely tell it like it is for sure. <laughs> I love that. I'm sure other creators would love to uh, hire them. It's almost like that movie Big. Do you remember that? Oh, With Tom yeah. Hanks. Yeah. So I he do. was the you know the 
was telling them if the toys were going to be so the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And I have three. I have three built in critics. So that works yeah. out pretty nicely. <laughs> Well, and what's nice too is they're different ages, so they right. can give you different perspectives based on. So you really you have a good gig, Belinda. Oh, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I can't complain. I do love it. You tell you told me you could hear the passion, but I am so passionate about it. I love what I do. Oh, I can tell. I mean, you can't fake that sort of excitement <laughs> with your job. And I'm curious too, just because I have always wondered this. I think sometimes people, maybe when they're starting, they think, "Well, I'll just do my own too," but. Give us a realistic, how long, how many hours would you say you spend creating one new activity on average? You know, it really varies. It depends on the lesson. Um, and I, I would say I could spend as little as maybe six or seven hours on a particular resource or as much as a week, depending upon the resource. I mean, some of the really detailed and intricate things I work on a lot and you do go back and forth just tweaking and making sure it it meets your particular standards. And sometimes you get into that mode of one, want, wanting everything to be perfect. And that's a bad habit of mine. Sometimes it's better just to kind of put it out there and then you can always go back and do your edits. Um, but I would encourage anyone who wants to give it a try. I say all the time that you should go for it. I'm mm -hmm. never going to be one to tell you not to try it. If it feels like you have a passion for it, if it feels like it's something that you want to do, then step outside of that comfort zone. If it's something that you're like, oh, I don't know if this is going to work for me, but I say try it. You, you only live once and you, you should give it a try versus talking yourself out of it. Exactly. No regrets. You just got to, I mean, imagine if you hadn't taken those, those leaps of faith and, right. and stepped outside of your comfort zone. And, and I think this is important too, where I think it's easy for people to think, well, I'll just t get the materials and I'll share them with others. But I, I mean, there is actual people behind those materials creating. And that's why I think it's so important for us to remember you're spending hours putting into that. So we really want to make sure that we keep that in mind. And it's easy to probably say, oh, here, just use this, just use this. But it's, there's somebody behind that putting in their blood, sweat and tears. Absolutely. And the same copyright laws apply and it's intellectual property. And mm -hmm. I love the fact that you said that you respect that. And I would hope that more therapists, more educators, more people in general would start to really take that into account and think about the person behind <laughs> the resource, not just the fact that I have this digital download and I can just email it out to someone else. There is somebody behind that that's going to miss out on all that hard work that they put into it. So I would encourage everyone to always read those terms of use and just familiarize yourself with copyright. I mean, it was something that I started researching before I even started on TPT. I mean, I definitely wanted to make sure that I wasn't infringing on anyone's copyright, but at the same time, once you release products, especially digital products, you don't want anyone to just go out there and share your materials without ensuring that they have multiple license agreements or something in place um, just to protect the little people because I am a very small business. Um, and so anytime someone just clicks share to someone else, it definitely affects me for sure. Yeah, I think sometimes it's easy to think about where it's like, oh, well, um, you know, the Target versus the mom and pop shop. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, well, they're making all this money. It's all right. It's all right. But it's really the creators, for the most part, it's a mom and pop shop. Oh, it's somebody absolutely. putting in that blood, sweat and tears. It's not a giant company that's that's got 16 developers creating things. It's, it's you. Right. And that's so yeah. true. And that's what I look at as far as like the mom and pop. It is a family affair. It's a very small business for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just me. I like to say as far as the creative side of things, the business side of things, I'm a one woman show. I do have a tremendous support system from my husband and my family. But when it comes to the creating and the um, resources and just the day to day business, it's just me right now. So mm -hmm. that definitely speaks to me to know that you know, it is a small business and to know that you have people out there in your court. And I know, Jennifer, you are definitely in my court just to just to protect that. So that that mm -hmm. definitely says a lot. I yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and I think it is it's it's as SLPs, too. We want to be able to transfer some of that skills and knowledge 
and use it for other things. But again, sometimes when you're putting that many hours in, it's like, okay, that's no longer a hobby. Mm-hmm. This is a job. Right. <laughs> One you love doing, but nonetheless, you're using your time and uh, skills to do it. Absolutely. And lots of long nights. I mean, in the very early stages, I am a night owl anyway, but I would spend so many nights up awake um, with the three boys. It's like I didn't want to take away from their time and mommy time. So I would wait until my boys were asleep. And I would say that you do have to, you have to love it. And I do love it. And I'm passionate about it. Otherwise, you're not going to put in that amount of effort to, to put together something because it does take time. It's not something that you can just do overnight. It's something that you really have to put the, the hours in to, to develop a product that you're, you're happy with. Absolutely. And how do you, I'm thinking you're on the computer all day doing teletherapy and then you're doing on the computer all night creating materials. How did you not get tired of looking at the computer? Oh, trust me. I definitely got tired of looking at the computer. (laughs) (laughs) I'm thinking my eyes would explode. (laughs) Right. And that was in the early stages. Now I can say I haven't really created as much here lately because of the the, the Mm -hmm. fact that things have been so incredibly busy, but you take breaks from it. You may have times where you're developing and you're maybe spending a couple of weeks that you're developing two weeks on, and then you might take a couple of weeks that you're not creating any new resources. So once you kind of build up that library of materials and resources, I can say that I've definitely slowed down tremendously when it comes to the the creating resources, but that's primarily because I've been focused so much on the boys and just distance learning with them right now. Yeah. No easy feat. (laughs) That's for sure. Not at all. And I know you said you have, you have some business background, which helped tremendously and your sister with doing some of the graphic design. If somebody was just getting started, what would you say, like, who would they, and it sounds like you did a lot of the research on your own with just copyright and whatnot. Is there somebody that you would recommend that you need, you would need to have this person 100% if you were going to try to do something similar? Or do you feel like somebody could figure these things out just by spending that time doing the research and figuring it out on their own? For me, you know, I'd say that to think that I had it all figured out when I started, I really didn't have it all figured out. Five years later, I still don't have it all figured out. So I feel like it's something that you are going to constantly evolve and grow and learn. Um, I'm a researcher by nature. I'm constantly researching things. So I will research it and sometimes over-research things and (laughs) overanalyze things and spend too much time on one area. But that's just the nature of who I am. But I'm always looking for ways to make either the creative process easier. I think that's how I discovered boom cards. It's like I was up one night and was doing research, trying to find interactive materials. And I stumbled upon boom learning and boom cards. And this was almost three years plus ago. So I started creating boom cards a a while ago. Um, But it's just the research and just always trying to find more innovative ways and more engaging ways to just... um, create resources. So I think it's the research. You really have to to spend the time researching. And I did a lot of that before I could say I kind of dove in to, to really try to crank up a business. I did the research first. Yeah, very important. <laughs> <laughs> very important. If you wanted to be successful, I should yes, say. Yes, <laughs> but then I can't say that I didn't make any mistakes. The thing about anything that you do, I mean, Being open-minded is so important. And it took me a while to get to that point of knowing that, okay, it's okay to make (laughs) those mistakes, but you learn from them. The thing about it is you can't spend too much time dwelling on something that you might have, quote unquote, thought you did wrong. It's like, okay, it was intended for you to learn from that, to grow from that. So just know going into anything, be it business or or teletherapy or anything that you're bound to have hiccups or or roadblocks or things that you might look at as a mistake, but you really need to think about, okay, what was I supposed to learn from that? What's the, what's the growth in there for me to take away something? And it took me a little while to get to that point. And I'm still working on getting to that point at times, but I'm constantly looking for ways to just improve upon, um, not being too critical or too hard on yourself, for sure. 
I love that you say that. And it's, it's, it's such an important reminder. And we have new grads that listen. We have people that have been in the field for a while, but it never it is that reminder never gets old. And I feel like oftentimes we have been thought in this profession to be made up of type A <laughs> personalities. And so I think that in itself is you're going to make mistakes. You're never going to be perfect. And you're exactly right. If we do things and never challenge ourselves, then you just, you get stagnant. Oh, you yeah. can't, my best learning has come from my biggest mistakes and it's stinks that that's how it works, but it just does. That's what that's I was just hearing about lobsters. So again, my my daughter had a speaker at her school last night, virtual speaker, and he was saying lobsters, how they grow is they actually um, get agitated, like get too big for their uh, their shells. And then that's what helps them grow. But it has to like there's a period of agitation and then they can grow. And mm -hmm. it was I'm not doing the story justice, but it was, he said, just remember lobster, lobsters. And so it's like, okay, <laughs> I, 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 apparently that struck a chord with me, but yeah, you have to have discomfort sometimes for there to be change. And that's so true. And that, that goes back to the stepping out of the comfort zone. It's like, yeah. if we stayed in the comfort zone forever, we would never grow. And as uncomfortable as it might be mm -hmm. to step out of the comfort zone. And I tell people all the time, putting yourself out there is not easy. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that it has been easy to put yourself out there, to put your products out there and, and hope that people are going to, to like them or accept them. But once you do it, you do feel like you have grown. Um, it definitely has taught me so much. I've learned so much in this process. I have so much more to learn. I am a lifelong learner, so I'm so open to just continuing to evolve and to continue to grow. But I know that that growth wouldn't have come, like you said, the lobster without that agitation, without that ability to to give yourself the opportunity to be uncomfortable for a little bit so that you can continue to grow. And I think the reward of seeing where you where you can go after you've had that period of kind of uncomfortable, that's what motivates you to the next step. Because it's so easy to then get to that next step and you're like, okay, I'm I'm good, I'm good. You know, I've gotten to that point, I've kind of leveled up to another area. But then, in order to continue to grow, you have to you have to get comfortable being outside of the comfort zone. Put it that way. <laughs> It, it is it's so hard. And, and the thought of rejection is hard. It's a, it, right. it touches on everything that we as humans don't like. <laughs> yes. But it's so, I'm sure you could look at Belinda from how, when you started this to Belinda now, you probably completely different person in so many ways. Oh yeah. It's been a, it's been a positive change. It's been mm -hmm. a positive evolution because I'm such a private person and I'm still very much a private person, even though I'm here sitting doing a podcast, but I'm, <laughs> I am a private person. And so putting myself out there and being vulnerable, um, that has not come easy, but the reward that has come as a result, the number of people that I've connected with through my blog has been that has been incredible. The emails that I get, the questions, just people who find me through the blog and will tell me that they may have saw one of my YouTube videos or they may have used one of my resources or whatever it might be. That reward just makes me realize that, okay, it's okay. that <laughs> I had to put myself out there in order to then make some of these connections that I would have never made otherwise. So it's been a very rewarding, growing experience. Yeah. And if you think about all the touch points that you probably don't even realize where it's, you took a chance, you created these awesome materials, Thank you. somebody who maybe didn't feel comfortable doing teletherapy, but did a bite because they had to maybe this last year, found your materials, were, felt like, okay, good. I have some resources. I have, were, was able to connect with their students in a meaningful way. And perhaps they now are like, I want to do this now forever. I mean, you just don't know all those. I guarantee that's probably happened more times than you'll, again, ever be aware of. So <laughs> 
So we're thankful that you put yourself out there because oh, if not, and, and I also am glad you reminded me about the boom cards because I love boom cards. Those <laughs> things are so fun. All of my boom cards that I sell through Boom Learning are also available on my TPT stores. Total three different storefronts is what I operate right now. So I have a Teachers Pay Teachers store, my Boom Learning store, and then my store that's on my website directly. Yeah. And again, your graphics and your, you just, I felt like you were ahead of the curve there too, where they just looked so sophisticated compared oh, to some of the you. other things. So um, yeah, very thank nice you, job there. Thank you. And I think it's the creative person in me. I've always been a crafter. I, I still, to this day, I love to craft. And so when I sit down to do a resource, even from the cover page, I don't want anything to look too plain. And you probably can tell that from my resources. And some people may think that it's a little bit too busy. But for me, I like that vibrant, you know, very colorful resource that can capture a student, even from the cover. Sometimes I'll open up some of the resources and the kids will just see the cover page and they get excited to be like, oh, I want to play this. And I love the fact that they think, okay, we're going to play. But of course, us as SLPs know that we are going to get a lot of trials and a lot yeah. of opportunities for you to use your language and those sounds, even though you might think you're about to play a game. So um, I just love to create and I just get into like an artsy mode of just trying to have it look a certain way. Um, and like you said, that type A, sometimes I spend too much time <laughs> trying to get it to look a certain way, but I... I really enjoy it. I, I'm passionate about it. Well, it's obvious. And <laughs> again, we're, we're glad that you are because you've benefited the profession by this passion. And I'm curious because, again, you have been doing this longer than a lot of people. What advice would you have for people that are new to teletherapy or curious about maybe they've done it or have never done it? What advice would you have, would you give to them? For new people just starting out, I will um, say again to just please be open-minded. Be open-minded to a new service delivery model, but be patient with yourself to know that there is going to be a learning curve. But once you become comfortable with the platform that you're using and you become comfortable with the technology, your skills and your expertise, they're going to shine through as you start to make that connection with your students build that rapport first, you know, spend that time in the very early stages, building rapport with your student, try to connect with the student. And you will find that some of the things that you traditionally did face to face, you're going to be able to then do those same things via teletherapy. So just kind of relax. And I know that's hard to say for a lot of SLPs, but just kind of go into it, relax and just really thinking about ways that you can connect with your student and know that the connection does come even though you are in front of a computer screen. It's certainly, I think a lot of people will be pleasantly surprised at how well they're able to connect with their students if they're just starting out in teletherapy. And most seasoned teletherapists will, I think, agree that once you get to know those students, it does not matter that you might be miles apart. Yeah, it's such a good reminder. And I felt the same way. And I remember one time, Somebody's saying, well, what do I do for the first day with them? And I said, well, what would you do if you're on site? Mm -hmm. Like you would get to know them. You'd introduce yourself. You'd talk about the rules. You'd maybe do some activity where you build rapport. Same thing. Absolutely. Just different medium. So oh, yeah. I think that is a, and I think your reminder, just be patient with ourselves. Give ourselves grace. It is okay And And it's also, I think, important. We're working oftentimes with students that, are struggling in different areas. Mm -hmm. And we only become more human to them when we say, listen, I am gonna <laughs> I am gonna make mistakes during this school year with this and we're gonna laugh about it, but we're gonna learn together. And I think again, just that vulnerable feeling of letting your students know, even me as an adult, who's helping you? I am not perfect. Nobody is. We're all, we're gonna both make mistakes together this year and but we're going to have fun doing it. And I agree with that so much. If you start your sessions out with your students, letting them know how human you actually are. And even though you're an adult, you basically are here to help them grow and to empower them. But at the same time, you're learning together. 
I, and one thing I'd say to my students all the time, they hear me say it, is I'm, I'm always learning. Ms. Givens loves to learn. I say that to my students so much. They probably get tired of hearing that, but I tell them that they teach me things. I learn from them. I might be an adult, but you're teaching me. So it's like I, I try, and I think it's so important for fellow SLPs to know that you, you want to really convey just a level of comfortability. You want them to feel comfortable, but they can only feel comfortable if they can kind of sense the fact that you're comfortable. So as hard as it might be in those first couple sessions, just relax and try not to take that if, if you can. <laughs> I know I've been doing this long enough that I can I can take an informal data. I don't have to jot that down. I can just have a conversation with my student, get to know them in the first couple of sessions, do a little inventory and just try to make them feel comfortable. You know, if they tell me something that they like, next session I might have that right there to pull up to show them so that now we're talking about it. Show and tell is incredible. <laughs> Let them bring something that they might want to share with you. When you get your students talking about something that they like, you have them. So, you know, and then turn it into a very structured activity, but the student doesn't have to know it's structured. So now they're bringing a show and tell item and you're just kind of talking, oh, what is that? Where did you get it from? Who do you play that with? So now you're going through all of your WH questions, but they're just thinking that you're talking to them. So in your mind as the therapist, as the professional, you are able to to get the data that you need in those first few sessions, but you're building a rapport at the same time. So even if that means you're doing it with an item that they're bringing from their toy box, it works. <laughs> I have witnessed it work and it's a great way to really get to know those students. Well, then it's functional. Exactly. And I love to, it's a reminder that we almost have to scaffold ourselves mm-hmm. <laughs> in our skills where it's like, okay, first you're, you're not going to take data. You're going to do this. You're going to, now when, right. as you get more proficient, then you can increase the complexity. We're no different than our students when trying to learn something new. Absolutely. That is so true. So you just want to finish with this is that, so you have been a successful SLP. You have been a successful teletherapist. You've got your BVG SLP store, website, resources. Um, What is next for you? What's, what else do you want to do? Wow. Next for me, I mean, first and foremost, family is always the priority. So in the short term, My focus right now is just to get my boys through distance learning. We've been doing this now from home since last spring. So it has been certainly a challenge, but we are hopefully in the final stretch. We're so close to the summer right now. So we are trying to finish strong. And so that has been what consumes me most every day. I won't say most days, that's every day. So (laughs) if you haven't seen me around as much, so to speak, in the different platforms or what have you, it's because I'm spending that time with my family right now and definitely making sure that my boys feel that they have the support that they need. Um, And just being able to witness firsthand and hearing other students that are in the sessions with my kiddos, it's like our babies need, they need that support. It's like they need us to be there first and foremost. So that's what I'm doing in the short term. In the long term, once they are back to school face to face, I want to get back to creating that's my passion. That's my joy. That's what I love to do when I have a list. Like I said, I do get lots of requests. And so I'm going to get to kind of fulfilling some of those requests. Um, And I love my students. I miss my students. So I do want to get back to treating. I'm passionate about that too. I do really feel like I'm here to stay in teletherapy. The teletherapy world has captured me and I love it. Um, I think I will be here for a very long time. So treating and creating resources. That's what drives me. That's what motivates me. And that's, that's what I love to do. That's what I'm going to be doing next, so to speak. Well, I cannot wait to see what's next. And I also love that you are so transparent about where your priorities are right now with your family, (laughs) because you just are, it's again, such a good reminder to that work-life balance. And I understand that not everybody has that luxury to say, well, I need to put that on hold 
But if you do in any way, I think that was such a great reminder for everybody that you love doing this. This is what you're you're professionally doing. But sometimes that focus has to shift based on what's going on in life. And so I think that's also just such a good reminder for humans. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I feel so blessed that I have been able to kind of put the professional side of things on pause for a short time. And I told my husband from the very beginning, it's like, okay, this is only temporary. And I know when I said that, I never thought that it would be a full year. I honestly did not think it would be a full year that we would be doing it. And here we are a year later. Um, But it has certainly taught me a lot in the year. And if anything, and you and I have talked about this before, Jennifer, but the idea of slowing down. I mean, I, I do feel like that was a big takeaway from all of this. And I know for a fact, returning to what we quote unquote call normal, it's not going to be the normal that it was for 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 us and my family. And I love the idea that we have been able to spend as much time together as we have been these past 12 plus months. It's just been at times it, it definitely gets to be <laughs> a little overwhelming, but at the same time, it's such a joy and a, a a great thing to have mm-hmm. the family here and to be able to have that level to provide that level of support to my to my kiddos cuz as hard as it has been for us as adults you know the kiddos are not always able to put it into words how yeah. difficult this has been for them so um just being there and being that support system has it consumes my days and and my nights now. That's why I'm not creating as much at night because I'm definitely making sure that my babies are taken care of. And I call them babies, but they will all, you know, I have a a ninth grader, a third grader and a first grader. So um, it's busy. It's busy every day. Yeah. Well, I, the same person who told the lobster story (laughs) said something that I thought was really interesting too, that relates to what you just said, that with other areas in in children's lives, and this is also applicable too for those of you working with students, it's easy to say if they're struggling with something, you can think, oh yeah, I remember going through that. This is how I handled it. It's There's some, some distance and time. Whereas this, we're all in it together at the same time going through. So it's not like you can look back and say, oh, this is how I got through that because we're in it now at the same time. And so, Mm -hmm. and we haven't been through this before. So it is a very interesting time. And I, I think it's a good reminder to make sure that even during therapy, sometimes when you're doing speech, it's important to stop and say, how are you? What's going on? do these, I call them my mental health check-ins with my own kids. It's like mental health check-in. They're like, oh gosh, mom, we're (laughs) fine. I'm like, I know, but we're still going to do it. (laughs) Yes, that is so true. And I'm glad you said that because even for like new teletherapists starting out, it's so important. We talk about building the rapport, but like you said, it's so important that you get to know them so that you can sense when they might need you to just have a very chill day. You know, Mm -hmm. you can just come, you pick the activity today. You, you kind of navigate what we're doing today, because I want you to know that this is a safe, comfortable space. And that's a part of our jobs. It's a part of what we do as as speech therapists. It's like, okay, it's okay for us to say there's no data collection today in our minds. And see, I'm one of those ones that it's like, okay, it's more important (laughs) that you are really getting to know and really taking an interest in that student. And the mental yeah. health part is extremely important, and especially right now. Yeah, 100%. Well, Belinda, I, you said the, I feel like we could talk for a week we and could. still not get it out of our <laughs> systems, but I am so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for your time. I know you have been very busy and you don't do a lot of these things, but I feel really honored that you came and spoke with us. And I encourage anybody, again, I discovered your products before I ever met you in BVG SLP. If you're doing any sort, and even if you're not doing teletherapy and go back on site, your activities would still be so fun, so easy to use. So go and check them out. They're, they're very, very well done. So I'm, I'm grateful for you and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. 
And that wraps up this episode. Thank you for tuning into SLP Full Disclosure. For more information about this episode, check out the show notes on our website at medtravelers.com slash SLP Full Disclosure. And don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so you never miss a guest. Are you interested in becoming a travel SLP? Visit medtravelers.com to learn more and explore the exciting opportunities we offer at top level facilities across the country. Also, a special thanks to Jonathan Carey for producing this episode and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. And as always, this episode was powered by Med Travelers. See you next time.